Atomic Habits by James Clear. Chapter 12. Produced by Kimuka Media. 2. Imitating the Many. In the 1950s, psychologist Solomon Ash conducted a series of experiments that are now taught to legions of undergrads each year. To begin each experiment, the subject entered the room with a group of strangers. Unbeknownst to them, the other participants were actors planted by the researcher and instructed to deliver scripted answers to certain questions. The group would be shown one card with a line on it and then a second card with a series of lines. Each person was asked to select the line on the second card that was similar in length to the line on the first card. It was a very simple task. Conforming to social norms. The experiment always began the same. First, there would be some easy trials where everyone agreed on the correct line. After a few rounds, the participants were shown a test that was just as obvious as the previous ones, except the actors in the room would select an intentionally incorrect answer. Everyone would agree that the lines were the same even though they were clearly different. The subject, who was unaware of the ruse, would immediately become bewildered. Their eyes would open wide. They would laugh nervously to themselves. They would double-check the reactions of other participants. Their agitation would grow as one person after another delivered the same incorrect response. Soon, the subject began to doubt their own eyes. Eventually, they delivered the answer they knew in their heart to be incorrect. Ash ran this experiment many times and in many different ways. What he discovered was that as the number of actors increased, so did the conformity of the subject. If it was just the subject and one actor, then there was no effect on the person's choice. They just assumed they were in the room with a dummy. When two actors were in the room with the subject, there was still little impact. But as the number of people increased to three actors and four and all the way to eight, the subject became more likely to second-guess themselves. By the end of the experiment, nearly 75% of the subjects had agreed with the group answer even though it was obviously incorrect. Whenever we are unsure how to act, we look to the group to guide our behavior. We are constantly scanning our environment and wondering, what is everyone else doing? We check reviews on Amazon or Yelp or TripAdvisor because we want to imitate the best buying, eating, and travel habits. It's usually a smart strategy. There is evidence in numbers. But there can be a downside. The normal behavior of the tribe often overpowers the desired behavior of the individual. For example, one study found that when a chimpanzee learns an effective way to crack nuts open as a member of one group and then switches to a new group that uses a less effective strategy, it will avoid using the superior nut cracking method just to blend in with the rest of the chimps. Humans are similar. There is tremendous internal pressure to comply with the norms of the group. The reward of being accepted is often greater than the reward of winning an argument, looking smart, or finding truth. Most days, we'd rather be wrong with the crowd than be right by ourselves. The human mind knows how to get along with others. It wants to get along with others. This is our natural mode. You can override it, you can choose to ignore the group or to stop caring what other people think, but it takes work. Running against the grain of your culture requires extra effort. When changing your habits means challenging the tribe, change is unattractive. When changing your habits means fitting in with the tribe, change is very attractive. 3. Imitating the powerful. Humans everywhere pursue power, prestige, and status. We want pins and medallions on our jackets. We want president or partner in our titles. We want to be acknowledged, recognized, and praised. This tendency can seem vain, but overall, it's a smart move. Historically, a person with greater power and status has access to more resources, worries less about survival, and proves to be a more attractive mate. We are drawn to behaviors that earn us respect, approval, admiration, and status. We want to be the one in the gym who can do muscle-ups, or the musician who can play the hardest chord progressions, or the parent with the most accomplished children, because these things separate us from the crowd. Once we fit in, we start looking for ways to stand out. 
This is one reason we care so much about the habits of highly effective people. We try to copy the behavior of successful people because we desire success ourselves. Many of our daily habits are imitations of people we admire. You replicate the marketing strategies of the most successful firms in your industry. You make a recipe from your favorite baker. You borrow the storytelling strategies of your favorite writer. You mimic the communication style of your boss. We imitate people we envy. High-status people enjoy the approval, respect, and praise of others. And that means if a behavior can get us approval, respect, and praise, we find it attractive. We are also motivated to avoid behaviors that would lower our status. We trim our hedges and mow our lawn because we don't want to be the slob of the neighborhood. When our mother comes to visit, we clean up the house because we don't want to be judged. We are continually wondering what will others think of me and altering our behavior based on the answer. The Polgar sisters, the chess prodigies mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, are evidence of the powerful and lasting impact social influences can have on our behavior. The sisters practiced chess for many hours each day and continued this remarkable effort for decades. But these habits and behaviors maintained their attractiveness, in part, because they were valued by their culture. From the praise of their parents to the achievement of different status markers like becoming a grandmaster, they had many reasons to continue their effort. Chapter Summary The culture we live in determines which behaviors are attractive to us. We tend to adopt habits that are praised and approved of by our culture because we have a strong desire to fit in and belong to the tribe. We tend to imitate the habits of three social groups, the close, family and friends, the many, the tribe, and the powerful, those with status and prestige. One of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is to join a culture where, one, your desired behavior is the normal behavior and, two, you already have something in common with the group. The normal behavior of the tribe often overpowers the desired behavior of the individual. Most days, we'd rather be wrong with the crowd than be right by ourselves. If a behavior can get us approval, respect, and praise, we find it attractive. How to find and fix the causes of your bad habits In late 2012, I was sitting in an old apartment just a few blocks from Istanbul's most famous street, Istiklal Jadesi. I was in the middle of a four-day trip to Turkey and my guide, Mike, was relaxing in a worn-out armchair a few feet away. Mike wasn't really a guide. He was just a guy from Maine who had been living in Turkey for five years, but he offered to show me around while I was visiting the country and I took him up on it. On this particular night, I had been invited to dinner with him and a handful of his Turkish friends. There were seven of us, and I was the only one who hadn't, at some point, smoked at least one pack of cigarettes per day. I asked one of the Turks how he got started. Friends, he said. It always starts with your friends. One friend smokes, then you try it. What was truly fascinating was that half of the people in the room had managed to quit smoking. Mike had been smoke-free for a few years at that point, and he swore up and down that he broke the habit because of a book called Alan Carr's Easy Way to Stop Smoking. It frees you from the mental burden of smoking, he said. It tells you, stop lying to yourself. You know you don't actually want to smoke. You know you don't really enjoy this. It helps you feel like you're not the victim anymore. You start to realize that you don't need to smoke. I had never tried a cigarette, but I took a look at the book afterward out of curiosity. The author employs an interesting strategy to help smokers eliminate their cravings. He systematically reframes each cue associated with smoking and gives it a new meaning. He says things like, you think you are quitting something, but you're not quitting anything because cigarettes do nothing for you. You think smoking is something you need to do to be social, but it's not. You can be social without smoking at all. You think smoking is about relieving stress, but it's not. Smoking does not relieve your nerves, it destroys them. Over and over, he repeats these phrases and others like them. Get it clearly into your mind, he says. 
you are losing nothing and you are making marvelous positive gains not only in health, energy, and money, but also in confidence, self-respect, freedom and, most important of all, in the length and quality of your future life. By the time you get to the end of the book, smoking seems like the most ridiculous thing in the world to do. And if you no longer expect smoking to bring you any benefits, you have no reason to smoke. It is an inversion of the second law of behavior change, make it unattractive. Now, I know this idea might sound overly simplistic. Just change your mind and you can quit smoking. But stick with me for a minute. Where cravings come from. Every behavior has a surface level craving and a deeper, underlying motive. I often have a craving that goes something like this, I want to eat tacos. If you were to ask me why I want to eat tacos, I wouldn't say, because I need food to survive. But the truth is, somewhere deep down, I am motivated to eat tacos, because I have to eat to survive. The underlying motive is to obtain food and water even if my specific craving is for a taco. Some of our underlying motives include, conserve energy, obtain food and water, find love and reproduce, connect and bond with others, win social acceptance and approval, reduce uncertainty, achieve status and prestige. A craving is just a specific manifestation of a deeper underlying motive. Your brain did not evolve with a desire to smoke cigarettes or to check Instagram or to play video games. At a deep level, you simply want to reduce uncertainty and relieve anxiety, to win social acceptance and approval, or to achieve status. Look at nearly any product that is habit-forming and you'll see that it does not create a new motivation, but rather latches onto the underlying motives of human nature. Find love and reproduce equals using Tinder. Connect and bond with others equals browsing Facebook. Win social acceptance and approval equals posting on Instagram. Reduce uncertainty equals searching on Google. Achieve status and prestige equals playing video games. Your habits are modern-day solutions to ancient desires. New versions of old vices. The underlying motives behind human behavior remain the same. The specific habits we perform differ based on the period of history. Here's the powerful part, there are many different ways to address the same underlying motive. One person might learn to reduce stress by smoking a cigarette. Another person learns to ease their anxiety by going for a run. Your current habits are not necessarily the best way to solve the problems you face, they are just the methods you learn to use. Once you associate a solution with the problem you need to solve, you keep coming back to it. Habits are all about associations. These associations determine whether we predict a habit to be worth repeating or not. As we covered in our discussion of the first law, your brain is continually absorbing information and noticing cues in the environment. Every time you perceive a cue, your brain runs a simulation and makes a prediction about what to do in the next moment. Cue, you notice that the stove is hot. Prediction, if I touch it I'll get burned, so I should avoid touching it. Cue, you see that the traffic light turned green. Prediction, if I step on the gas, I'll make it safely through the intersection and get closer to my destination, so I should step on the gas. You see a cue, categorize it based on past experience, and determine the appropriate response. This all happens in an instant, but it plays a crucial role in your habits, because every action is preceded by a prediction. Life feels reactive, but it is actually predictive. All day long, you are making your best guess of how to act, given what you've just seen and what has worked for you in the past. You are endlessly predicting what will happen in the next moment. Our behavior is heavily dependent on these predictions. Put another way, our behavior is heavily dependent on how we interpret the events that happen to us, not necessarily the objective reality of the events themselves. Two people can look at the same cigarette, and one feels the urge to smoke while the other is repulsed by the smell. The same cue can spark a good habit or a bad habit depending on your prediction. The cause of your habits is actually the prediction that precedes them. These predictions lead to feelings, which is how we typically describe a craving, a feeling, a desire, an urge. Feelings and emotions transform the cues we perceive and the predictions we make into a signal that we can apply. 
they help explain what we are currently sensing. For instance, whether or not you realize it, you are noticing how warm or cold you feel right now. If the temperature drops by 1 degree, you probably won't do anything. If the temperature drops 10 degrees, however, you'll feel cold and put on another layer of clothing. Feeling cold was the signal that prompted you to act. You have been sensing the cues the entire time, but it is only when you predict that you would be better off in a different state that you take action. A craving is the sense that something is missing. It is the desire to change your internal state. When the temperature falls, there is a gap between what your body is currently sensing and what it wants to be sensing. This gap between your current state and your desired state provides a reason to act. Desire is the difference between where you are now and where you want to be in the future. Even the tiniest action is tinged with the motivation to feel differently than you do in the moment. When you binge eat or light up or browse social media, what you really want is not a potato chip or a cigarette or a bunch of likes. What you really want is to feel different. Our feelings and emotions tell us whether to hold steady in our current state or to make a change. They help us decide the best course of action. Neurologists have discovered that when emotions and feelings are impaired, we actually lose the ability to make decisions. We have no signal of what to pursue and what to avoid. As the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio explains, it is emotion that allows you to mark things as good, bad, or indifferent. To summarize, the specific cravings you feel and habits you perform are really an attempt to address your fundamental underlying motives. Whenever a habit successfully addresses a motive, you develop a craving to do it again. In time, you learn to predict that checking social media will help you feel loved or that watching YouTube will allow you to forget your fears. Habits are attractive when we associate them with positive feelings, and we can use this insight to our advantage rather than to our detriment. How to reprogram your brain to enjoy hard habits. You can make hard habits more attractive if you can learn to associate them with a positive experience. Sometimes, all you need is a slight mindset shift. For instance, we often talk about everything we have to do in a given day. You have to wake up early for work. You have to make another sales call for your business. You have to cook dinner for your family. Now, imagine changing just one word, you don't have to. You get to. You get to wake up early for work. You get to make another sales call for your business. You get to cook dinner for your family. By simply changing one word, you shift the way you view each event. You transition from seeing these behaviors as burdens and turn them into opportunities. The key point is that both versions of reality are true. You have to do those things, and you also get to do them. We can find evidence for whatever mindset we choose. I once heard a story about a man who uses a wheelchair. When asked if it was difficult being confined, he responded, I'm not confined to my wheelchair, I am liberated by it. If it wasn't for my wheelchair, I would be bed-bound and never able to leave my house. This shift in perspective completely transformed how he lived each day. Reframing your habits to highlight their benefits rather than their drawbacks is a fast and lightweight way to reprogram your mind and make a habit seem more attractive. Exercise Many people associate exercise with being a challenging task that drains energy and wears you down. You can just as easily view it as a way to develop skills and build you up. Instead of telling yourself I need to go run in the morning, say it's time to build endurance and get fast. Finance Saving money is often associated with sacrifice. However, you can associate it with freedom rather than limitation if you realize one simple truth. Living below your current means increases your future means. The money you save this month increases your purchasing power next month. Meditation Anyone who has tried meditation for more than three seconds knows how frustrating it can be when the next distraction inevitably pops into your mind. You can transform frustration into delight when you realize that each interruption gives you a chance to practice returning to your breath. Distraction is a good thing because you need distractions to practice meditation. Pre-game jitters 
Many people feel anxious before delivering a big presentation or competing in an important event. They experience quicker breathing, a faster heart rate, heightened arousal. If we interpret these feelings negatively, then we feel threatened and tense up. If we interpret these feelings positively, then we can respond with fluidity and grace. You can reframe I am nervous to I am excited and I'm getting an adrenaline rush to help me concentrate. These little mindset shifts aren't magic, but they can help change the feelings you associate with a particular habit or situation. If you want to take it a step further, you can create a motivation ritual. You simply practice associating your habits with something you enjoy, then you can use that cue whenever you need a bit of motivation. For instance, if you always play the same song before having sex, then you'll begin to link the music with the act. Whenever you want to get in the mood, just press play. Ed Lattimore, a boxer and writer from Pittsburgh, benefited from a similar strategy without knowing it. Odd realization, he wrote. My focus and concentration goes up just by putting my headphones on while writing. I don't even have to play any music. Without realizing it, he was conditioning himself. In the beginning, he put his headphones on, played some music he enjoyed, and did focused work. After doing it 5, 10, 20 times, putting his headphones on became a cue that he automatically associated with increased focus. The craving followed naturally. Athletes use similar strategies to get themselves in the mindset to perform. During my baseball career, I developed a specific ritual of stretching and throwing before each game. The whole sequence took about 10 minutes, and I did it the same way every single time. While it physically warmed me up to play, more importantly, it put me in the right mental state. I began to associate my pre-game ritual with feeling competitive and focused. Even if I wasn't motivated beforehand, by the time I was done with my ritual, I was in game mode. You can adapt this strategy for nearly any purpose. Say you want to feel happier in general. Find something that makes you truly happy, like petting your dog or taking a bubble bath, and then create a short routine that you perform every time before you do the thing you love. Maybe you take three deep breaths and smile. Three deep breaths. Smile. Pet the dog. Repeat. Eventually, you'll begin to associate this breathe and smile routine with being in a good mood. It becomes a cue that means feeling happy. Once established, you can break it out anytime you need to change your emotional state. Stressed at work? Take three deep breaths and smile. Sad about life? Three deep breaths and smile. Once a habit has been built, the cue can prompt a craving, even if it has little to do with the original situation. The key to finding and fixing the causes of your bad habits is to reframe the associations you have about them. It's not easy, but if you can reprogram your predictions, you can transform a hard habit into an attractive one. Chapter Summary The inversion of the second law of behavior change is make it unattractive. Every behavior has a surface-level craving and a deeper underlying motive. Your habits are modern-day solutions to ancient desires. The cause of your habits is actually the prediction that precedes them. The prediction leads to a feeling. Highlight the benefits of avoiding a bad habit to make it seem unattractive. Habits are attractive when we associate them with positive feelings and unattractive when we associate them with negative feelings. Create a motivation ritual by doing something you enjoy immediately before a difficult habit. The third law. Make it easy. Walk slowly, but never backward. On the first day of class, Jerry Yulsman, a professor at the University of Florida, divided his film photography students into two groups. Everyone on the left side of the classroom, he explained, would be in the quantity group. They would be graded solely on the amount of work they produced. On the final day of class, he would tally the number of photos submitted by each student. 100 photos would rate an A, 90 photos AB, 80 photos AC, and so on. Meanwhile, everyone on the right side of the room would be in the quality group. They would be graded only on the excellence of their work. They would only need to produce one photo during the semester, but to get an A, it had to be a nearly perfect image. 
At the end of the term, he was surprised to find that all the best photos were produced by the quantity group. During the semester, these students were busy taking photos, experimenting with composition and lighting, testing out various methods in the darkroom, and learning from their mistakes. In the process of creating hundreds of photos, they honed their skills. Meanwhile, the quality group sat around speculating about perfection. In the end, they had little to show for their efforts other than unverified theories and one mediocre photo. It is easy to get bogged down trying to find the optimal plan for change. The fastest way to lose weight, the best program to build muscle, the perfect idea for a side hustle. We are so focused on figuring out the best approach that we never get around to taking action. As Voltaire once wrote, the best is the enemy of the good. I refer to this as the difference between being in motion and taking action. The two ideas sound similar, but they're not the same. When you're in motion, you're planning and strategizing and learning. Those are all good things, but they don't produce a result. Action, on the other hand, is the type of behavior that will deliver an outcome. If I outline 20 ideas for articles I want to write, that's motion. If I actually sit down and write an article, that's action. If I search for a better diet plan and read a few books on the topic, that's motion. If I actually eat a healthy meal, that's action. Sometimes motion is useful, but it will never produce an outcome by itself. It doesn't matter how many times you go talk to the personal trainer, that motion will never get you in shape. Only the action of working out will get the result you're looking to achieve. If motion doesn't lead to results, why do we do it? Sometimes we do it because we actually need to plan or learn more. But more often than not, we do it because motion allows us to feel like we're making progress without running the risk of failure. Most of us are experts at avoiding criticism. It doesn't feel good to fail or to be judged publicly, so we tend to avoid situations where that might happen. And that's the biggest reason why you slip into motion rather than taking action, you want to delay failure. It's easy to be in motion and convince yourself that you're still making progress. You think, I've got conversations going with four potential clients right now. This is good. We're moving in the right direction. Or, I brainstormed some ideas for that book I want to write. This is coming together. Motion makes you feel like you're getting things done. But really, you're just preparing to get something done. When preparation becomes a form of procrastination, you need to change something. You don't want to merely be planning. You want to be practicing. If you want to master a habit, the key is to start with repetition, not perfection. You don't need to map out every feature of a new habit. You just need to practice it. This is the first takeaway of the third law, you just need to get your reps in. How long does it actually take to form a new habit? Habit formation is the process by which a behavior becomes progressively more automatic through repetition. The more you repeat an activity, the more the structure of your brain changes to become efficient at that activity. Neuroscientists call this long-term potentiation, which refers to the strengthening of connections between neurons in the brain based on recent patterns of activity. With each repetition, cell-to-cell -cell signaling improves and the neural connections tighten. First described by neuropsychologist Donald Hebb in 1949, this phenomenon is commonly known as Hebb's Law, neurons that fire together wire together. Repeating a habit leads to clear physical changes in the brain. In musicians, the cerebellum, critical for physical movements like plucking a guitar string or pulling a violin bow, is larger than it is in non-musicians. Mathematicians, meanwhile, have increased gray matter in the inferior parietal lobule, which plays a key role in computation and calculation. Its size is directly correlated with the amount of time spent in the field, the older and more experienced the mathematician, the greater the increase in gray matter. When scientists analyzed the brains of taxi drivers in London, they found that the hippocampus, a region of the brain involved in spatial memory, was significantly larger in their subjects than in non-taxi drivers. Even more fascinating, the hippocampus decreased in size when a driver retired. Like the muscles of the body responding to regular weight training, 
particular regions of the brain adapt as they are used and atrophy as they are abandoned. Of course, the importance of repetition in establishing habits was recognized long before neuroscientists began poking around. In 1860, the English philosopher George H. Lewis noted, in learning to speak a new language, to play on a musical instrument, or to perform unaccustomed movements, great difficulty is felt, because the channels through which each sensation has to pass have not become established, but no sooner has frequent repetition cut a pathway than this difficulty vanishes, the actions become so automatic that they can be performed while the mind is otherwise engaged. Both common sense and scientific evidence agree, repetition is a form of change. Each time you repeat an action, you are activating a particular neural circuit associated with that habit. This means that simply putting in your reps is one of the most critical steps you can take to encoding a new habit. It is why the students who took tons of photos improved their skills, while those who merely theorized about perfect photos did not. One group engaged in active practice, the other in passive learning. One in action, the other in motion. All habits follow a similar trajectory from effortful practice to automatic behavior, a process known as automaticity. Automaticity is the ability to perform a behavior without thinking about each step, which occurs when the non-conscious mind takes over. One of the most common questions I hear is, how long does it take to build a new habit? But what people really should be asking is, how many does it take to form a new habit? That is, how many repetitions are required to make a habit automatic? There is nothing magical about time passing with regard to habit formation. It doesn't matter if it's been 21 days or 30 days or 300 days. What matters is the rate at which you perform the behavior. You could do something twice in 30 days or 200 times. It's the frequency that makes the difference. Your current habits have been internalized over the course of hundreds, if not thousands, of repetitions. New habits require the same level of frequency. You need to string together enough successful attempts until the behavior is firmly embedded in your mind and you cross the habit line. In practice, it doesn't really matter how long it takes for a habit to become automatic. What matters is that you take the actions you need to take to make progress. Whether an action is fully automatic is of less importance. To build a habit, you need to practice it. And the most effective way to make practice happen is to adhere to the third law of behavior change, make it easy. The chapters that follow will show you how to do exactly that. Chapter Summary The third law of behavior change is make it easy. The most effective form of learning is practice, not planning. Focus on taking action, not being in motion. Habit formation is the process by which a behavior becomes progressively more automatic through repetition. The amount of time you have been performing a habit is not as important as the number of times you have performed it.